Welcome to the Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. My guest today on the Cognitive Crucible is Greg Radebaugh, who was the director of the Joint Information Operations Warfare Center, and you will hear us refer to this as the JIOWIC, from 2012 to 2018. Currently, he leads Gray Bear Consulting, providing a variety of consulting services related to informational power, information operations, and cognitive security policy. Greg Radebaugh, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Could we start off, Greg, by you giving our audience just a little bit more information about your long national security career? Sure. I enlisted in the Air Force in 1974 and uh, was made a Chinese linguist. And from that point, I flew reconnaissance missions in the Far East and Southeast Asia. From there, I transferred to the National Security Agency, where I was a linguist and analyst there. And then I was accepted to officer training school in 1979. From there, I uh, graduated uh, from intelligence school. And uh, my first assignment was to the Air Force Electronic Warfare Center as their chief of special activities. From that point, I then started working for the Air Force Intelligence Service. And in 1983, I transferred to Korea, where I was the assistant director of operations for the largest intelligence unit in Korea. And from 83 to 84, it was very interesting because we had the KAL Flight 7 shoot down and the Rangoon bombing, which kept everybody on their toes. And then in 1984, I was fortunate enough to transfer to Washington to the then Defense Intelligence College, which is now the National Military Intelligence University, where I got my Master of Science in Strategic Intelligence and stayed on at DIA from 1985-89 as a Soviet space operations analyst. In 1989, I transitioned off of active duty to the reserves and hired on at DIA as a Soviet strategic uh, weapons R&D analyst. And while in that capacity, I was fortunate enough to work for the on-site inspection agency as a start an INF treaty inspector, where I did uh, 30 missions into the former evil empire. And then in 1989, I'm sorry, 1996, I left uh, Washington, D.C. to move to San Antonio, Texas, where I became a senior information operations planner for the Air Force. And then in 1998, I uh, moved to the Joint Command and Control Warfare Center, which is one of the old incarnations of JIWIC as their Jeffity Chief of Special Plans. And then in 2000, I was selected by the Air Force Information Warfare Center to be director of their IO and cyber analysis, which I did until about 2010, where the Air Force ISR agency picked me up to be their Chief of Policy, Doctrine, Studies, and Analysis. And in 2011, I was selected to be the Chief of Cyber Operations for the Air Force ISR agency. And then in 2012, I was extremely fortunate to be selected as the Director of the Joint IO Warfare Center, which I consider the best assignment I've ever had. And that takes us up to today. All right. Well, thanks for that recap. And my goodness, what an interesting trajectory you've had. So. The conversation I'd like to have with you today is about informational power, and uh, we can unpack that in a minute. But before we do, could you tell our audience a little bit more about the JIOWIC itself, its purpose, its mission, and whatever, whatever else you think would be relevant there? The Joint Information Operations Warfare Center is a chairman's controlled activity under the chairman for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. There are, I believe, seven total CCAs, as they're called, and the JIWIC works for the chairman via the director of operations, the J3 at the joint staff. And uh, the purpose is to enable the application of informational power at the strategic level and execute informational power at the operational and tactical level 
and perform chairman responsibilities for joint enterprise IO proponency, operations security, and military deception and global operations. So prior to 2016, the JIAWIC was focused mainly on providing informational power at the operational tactical level in support of the combatant commands. And in 2016, the chairman, then General Joe Dunford, had set up these new global campaign plans and asked if we'd be able to flex and support the global planning. And so we did reorganize the center to be able to support each of the campaign plans. And then shortly thereafter, the general asked me if I could help him in applying informational power at the strategic level because his opinion was we did pretty well at the operational and tactical level, but where we really needed help was at the strategic level. Mm -hmm. And so the center was slightly reorganized again to help the chairman and the secretary apply informational power across the department and the combatant commands at the strategic level, and also work on how do we get that done at the interagency level. So like working with the global engagement center and, and other folks like that. And the big change at the center is that it has been in San Antonio, Texas, ever since it stood up in 1980. It's the Joint Electronic Warfare Center. And it transitioned from that to the Joint Command and Control Warfare Center, to the Joint IO Warfare Center, to the now current Joint IO Warfare Center. And the joint staff has decided to move it to the Washington, D.C. area which unfortunately has had a negative impact on the center's capabilities because the bulk of the subject matter expertise resides with the civilian members who have had decades of IO experience and contractors who are not transitioning to Washington, D.C. So it's going to take a while to rebuild the center's capabilities there. Right. Okay. Well, thank you for that recap and history lesson on the JIAWIC. It's really interesting. Could we draw on your multi-decade national security perspective, Greg, and uh, I would love to learn from you how you see our current national security climate. Well, I look at it from an informational power perspective, and I believe we're in a very dangerous period now. And it's not that adversaries haven't been using informational power against us for decades and more. But what I see is that they're becoming much more competitive and much more adept at operations in the information environment. So even though nation state actors like Russia, China, Iran, North Korea are involved in this 24-7, uh, even militarily unsophisticated adversaries, and that's a relative term like ISIS and the Taliban, are becoming very adept at operations in the information environment. For example, ISIS used social media for recruiting and planning and operations. And uh, if you look at the most recent events with the drawdown in Afghanistan, compare the resulting world perception of the United States when you look at uh, President Biden's speech that he did about Afghanistan, and then thereafter the Taliban press conference and which they were criticizing us for social media conducting censorship, where they're saying, look at us, we're open and we're ready for questions. So to me, that was a failure at operations in the information environment from a strategic standpoint. And so uh, my humble personal opinion is that the way the Afghan pullout is going right now, it is damaged U.S. ability to influence adversary behavior and allied support. Uh, while our military people and capabilities are second to none, uh, unless there is the perception by outside actors that we will apply military power competently and successfully, we'll face increasing challenges to our national security. In a sense, it's like the national security challenges President Kennedy faced after the Bay of Pigs, in which Nikita Khrushchev pushed him to the Cuban Missile Crisis, I personally think adversaries will be stepping up to challenge U.S. interests, and informational power has been and will be a large part of this. 
Yeah, thanks for all of that, Greg. And I should have mentioned at the top, we are recording this on Wednesday, August 18th, 2021. And front and center in the news right now is the American withdrawal from Afghanistan, the Taliban recapture of the, of the country, and all kinds of discussions about implications of how all of this is unfolding on the world stage. Do you have any other thoughts about how this maps on to strategic information operations and informational power? I like to refer back to a uh, quote from the current director of the Joint Iowa Warfare Center, Jim Harrell, in which he noted that war is a contest of wills, and will is observed through behavior, and behavior is changed through influence, thus war is about influence. And at this point, uh, the United States is losing the strategic war of influence in the information environment. Right. I can imagine that both China and Russia are going to be exploiting all kinds of empirical observations. I mean, there's all kinds of video footage that they can turn around and, and use for their purposes to, to help persuade, as you say, other island nations, nations closer to Russia, former Baltic nations, and, mm -hmm. you know, craft all kinds of disparaging narratives, which could be extremely detrimental to the United States. Would you say that that's fair? True. And what people need to understand is that the information environment is a globally contested space. So when you look at Russian information confrontation and China's three warfares, and how violent extremist organizations uh, operate in this environment. This has been going on 24 seven for years. And so I would say that from my perspective, there's no such thing as peacetime in the information environment. While we operate in phase zeros, our adversaries and potential adversaries are operating in phases two to four. Mm -hmm. And we are having information rounds fired at us 24 seven. Right. I'd like to put a pin in that for just a moment and come back to it towards the end of the discussion and ask you, what do you think the United States should be doing differently in order to go from phase zero to something other than phase zero? zero? But let's put a pin in that for just a moment and let's start unpacking the concept of informational power. And uh, you, Greg, could it, uh, you could teach a, a graduate level course on informational power, I believe, but let's, let's start unpacking this. So like, if you could start with just like a, a high level, what is informational power? I believe it maps onto joint doctrine. How did the term come about? We'll talk about how does this affect the force, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But could, could we start with just a, a high level of what you mean by informational power? Certainly. The phrase informational power was coined by the previous chairman, General Joe Dunford, who, in my opinion, is one of the most savvy individuals about information and the information environment. And he pushed the joint force quite strongly in learning to incorporate informational power in their operations. Uh, from his viewpoint, the only way you were going to succeed is if you combined informational power with physical power. So if we look at information in context, you know, there are inherent informational aspects to all military activities and all military activities impact the information environment. And this was incorporated into joint publication one. And then General Dunford also established information as a joint function, which is important because that, uh, forces joint force commanders to consider that as one of the key things they have to plan for and execute as part of their operations. And uh, joint function encompasses the management and application of information to influence relevant actor perceptions, behavior, action, or inaction, and support human and automated decision making. So this joint function of information groups these relative capabilities and activities to synchronize, integrate, and direct joint operations. And that helps joint force commanders apply informational power. And so the, the military, and that's what I'm most familiar with, applies its informational power by way of operations in the information environment. 
and that becomes part of the military instrument of national power. And that's expressed again, like I said earlier, uh, through the integration of physical and informational power. And then you also have to think about the inherent informational aspects uh, the diplomatic, economic instruments of national power, and they all contribute to this informational instrument of national power. All right. Thanks for that introduction. I'd like to talk a little bit about the doctrine surrounding this term. And we had a conversation before we started recording on this. You're privy to some information about Joint Pub 3-13 getting updated to something new, Joint Pub 3-XX. It's still in development. But in that pub, there is a discussion evolving about the formal definitions of informational power. To the extent that you can share, what, what are some of the formal definitions that are percolating to the top? When General Dunford established information as a joint function and the concept of informational power, that affected Joint Pub 1 which is doctrine for the armed forces of the United States. And then the joint function went further into joint pub 3-0, which is joint operations, where it talked about grouping related capabilities and activities together to integrate, synchronize, and direct joint operations for informational power. Uh, the next step down is how do you apply informational power by way of ops in the information environment and so back in 2016, 2017, we were looking at, okay, do we need to update 3-13, which is information operations, or is there a new pub that we need to bring together to kind of encompass all these new concepts? And so the GIOIC started uh, developing a joint pub 3-XX. And it has been ongoing in deliberations and coordination with the services and the joint world since about 2017 to today. Mm. And I know the JIWIC is involved in going through and uh, adjudicating comments to 3-XX even now. So I think we're getting close to it uh, coming out. But part of the reason it took so long to get to where we are with 3-XX is the services shift from information operations to information warfare. And that's because the services perceive of their duty is combat and warfare. So to them, information warfare more accurately describes what they do in the operational environment. Hmm. Whereas uh, what uh, General Dunford, and we were thinking of as informational power, describes that uh, military instrument of information that we apply across the joint enterprise, and more importantly, interagency. So one of your previous guests on the podcast, Austin Branch, who was also one of the uh, startup members of the Information Professionals Association. That's right, yeah. He was instrumental in changing the definition of information warfare to information operations but because of this conflict that we would run into when we're working in interagency, for example, if you go to State Department to coordinate information activities, they would go, oh, no, you guys do warfare. We don't do that. That's not our job. But everybody does operations. And so if you go to State or DHS and talk about, hey, we are doing some information operations that you're a part of that we needed to be a part of they're more accepting of that perceptually because we're not coming in as dod doing warfare and so general dunford took that to okay informational power which is our ability to leverage information to shape perceptions and behavior over the course of events that applies to everybody and so we didn't have a problem with the services speaking from a joint perspective going back to saying, I want to do information warfare, because to us, that was just a subset of informational power. And so that enabled them to concentrate on what capabilities and things they wanted to actually conduct operations in the information environment, whereas the joint world, we were looking at it more from a strategic uh, perspective. Okay, how do I blend all these services capabilities along with our allies into informational power that we can apply to adversaries. And so 
that drove uh, this definition that's in 3-XX of operations in the information environment, which is the application of information to change or maintain the perceptions, attitudes, and other elements that drive desired behaviors of relevant actors in the course of events. And so that can involve what I refer to as soft informational power, which is shaping and influencing target perceptions and decisions through activities such as military information support of operations, public affairs, multidiscipline security, military deception, civil military operations, cyberspace operations, and you know military activities like deployments and showing the flag things. Whereas when you finally get into physical conflict, then you would conduct what I would call hard informational power, which is you're attacking and shaping information conduits to affect target decisions and their dissemination through means such as command and control, disruption, destruction, electronic warfare, directed energy, physical destruction, cyberspace operations, military deception, and so on. So the good thing about soft informational power is that it's something that you can apply in peacetime and you can use it to shape prospective battle spaces to hopefully the point where you never reach the prospect of having to engage in physical armed conflict. Whereas when you get into physical hard conflict, then you change your purpose of now I'm going after specific adversaries and the means that they have to receive information disseminate oper- information, assess information, and so on. So this is a bit of a sidebar question, but the whole, the whole discussion around you know, how long it's taking and why to produce another joint pub 3-XX to replace 3-13 you know, begs the question, how necessary is joint doctrine? Because it looks to me like the services are moving out on their own trajectories, complementary, you know, going in the same direction. So what's, you know, some, some people in our audience may be asking, you know, what is the value of these uh, joint pubs? Well, it, it matters from two perspectives. One is resourcing and allocation of capabilities. Mm -hmm. And the second is our allied partners. Um, Many of our allied partners piggyback off of our di- our joint doctrine mm-hmm. so that they are in sync with what we do. And so they see the terminology and concepts that we propose mm-hmm. and we follow. It's almost like a, um, like an international standard, like a technology standard that. Yeah. From that perspective, you're right. But think of it also as a kind of like a, a starting point, a recipe that, uh, you know, you can adjust the recipe as uh, situations dictate, Mm -hmm. but it gives everybody the same starting point of when I talk about operations in the information environment, here's what I mean. When I talk about informational power, here's what I mean. Mm -hmm. When I talk about the joint enterprise, how are they supposed to conduct operations and synchronize? And that goes back to how do I get you know, like CENTCOM to look at ops in the information environment the same way that UCOM does, the same way that PACOM does, so that, you know, they adjust it to their operational environments and requirements, but we're able to share analysis and conclusions and uh, capabilities amongst all the combatant commands so that when you go from one combatant command to another, they're able to have a a synchronicity and a, a similarity that eases us into, okay, this research, MISO, I need X number of uh, MIS teams to, to accomplish this. And that helps me in resourcing a SOCOM and the Army for here's my requirement. And again, organizations like CAPE and OSD policy and USDI look at joint doctrine as, okay, this is the starting point and this is gets everybody kind of on the same sheet of music. But when the guano hits the rotating blades, you're going to have jazz ensembles because you're going to change and react. 
as the situation dictates, but at least you have a common starting point. So I'd like to come back to where we were a few moments ago. We were talking about Afghanistan and what we should be doing instead of what we are doing. And I believe you said that you know we're way behind. We're still at square zero while our adversaries are operating strategically in the information environment. So this is kind of one of those, if you were king for a day kind of a question, what would you be recommending to the very most senior leaders in the U.S. government as to what we should be doing in order to start getting ahead of and winning the strategic information fight? Well, first off, you have to understand that our potential adversaries, when they are operating in the information environment, they are doing it as a whole of society effort. So when, for example, Vladimir Putin wants to make a point in the information environment, he doesn't have to worry about what the rest of Russia will do because the government will follow his lead, the military will follow his lead, academia will follow his lead, the commercial sector will follow his lead. And so it's a more focused application of informational power. The same thing goes for China and so on. And the difficulty we have is that, uh, you know, we seem to barely function at departmental level, much less as a whole of government effort. And so going back to my earlier comment about uh, we're not successful at the strategic level, that's from a whole of government aspect. When I left uh, the JILIC back in 2018, the department and the combatant commands were really getting together on the strategic application of informational power from the standpoint that they were looking at the problem sets from a global perspective and how do we characterize that environment and how do we synchronize our activities and actions amongst the combatant commands focused on that global environment. What other senior leaders in the government have not internalized yet from my observation is that they don't understand that there is a steady state of warfare just below armed conflict now ongoing 24-7. And our potential adversaries are conducting operational preparation in the battle space right now, and there are no safe internal lines of communication. And so the implication of that is the geometry of war has changed. Our senior leaders still think of warfare and conflict in material slash physical space terms, and they still rely on these Western concepts of the law of armed conflict, relying on Westphalian concepts of chivalry, territorial integrity, and what constitutes an armed conflict. And our adversaries are not bound by that. So whereas we see the information environment as peacetime phase zero until actual conflict arises, our adversaries treat it as a battle space 24-7. And so... Because we have that perception, we don't think of applying informational power to shape our potential battle spaces until we actually feel like we're in uh, physical conflict. And to that point, to even achieve a whole of government effort, I think if I were king for a day, I would set up something that's equivalent to like the National Counterterrorism Center. Before NTCC was stood up, A lot of our CT efforts were just kind of uh, DOD was doing its thing and DHS was doing its thing and state was doing its thing. And with NCTC stood together, you had all the decision makers present in one place. And that's where the nitty gritty operational planning and execution was taking place, which freed up the National Security Council from having to do that and getting down into the nitty gritty details. So from my perspective, the National Security Council's job is to take the 100,000 foot look at what's going on and develop the policy and the endpoints for the rest of the government to uh, follow. A great example of that was back in the 1940s, Ren SD 68 uh, regarding the Soviet Union was written. And it basically stated to the whole government, our adversary is communism in the Soviet Union, and we will do everything we can to contain communism and disrupt and defeat the Soviet Union's efforts to spread communism. 
And as long as you were acting within these goalposts, you know, have at it. And so it didn't require the micromanagement that I had seen in the past of getting down and approving specific information operation activities from the NSC level. In essence, what we need them to do is just provide a vector and say, go do. And as long as you're within the left and right margins, you're good. And that way they can focus on that 100,000 foot level of what's our end state, what do we need to be doing, and offload that operational planning and execution effort onto a joint uh, enterprise for informational power. Other possibilities are within the joint realm for DOD. Could they set up a informational functional combatant command like they did with uh, STRATCOM and Special Operations Command. Should a combat command have a sub-unified command for information? Would there be a need for a standing joint interagency task force for information, you know, at the DOD joint level that uh, might be the one that coordinates DOD with this whole of government effort? So in essence, if we want to be successful at that strategic level, the challenges that we run into are, you know, establishing, in essence, the strategic narratives. What are the threats and what do you want to communicate about them? And then establishing, refining businesses practices, you know, coordinating a departmental whole of government and coalition effort and keeping senior Lotus leaders focused on the strategic vice, the tactical. And more importantly, deciding what's important. One of the biggest challenges we run into is how do you characterize the information environment? For example, when a commander walks into his operations center, he can look up at the monitors and see a physical presentation of his battle space and know where his forces are, where the adversary forces are, uh, what are the projected lines of attack. But we don't have that yet in full for the information environment. So it's important for commanders be, to be able to understand and characterize this environment so they can make the right decisions as to how to respond. Because not ever, every adversary statement requires a response. But like I said earlier, with information rounds being fired at you 24 seven, you have to know which ones are dangerous hits and which ones you can ignore and which ones you need to respond to. All right, well, those are, some solid, thoughtful recommendations for our audience to consider adopting and getting ahead of and staying ahead of this information challenge. And with that, Greg Radabaugh, thank you so much for being on The Cognitive Crucible. Thanks very much for having me. It was an honor to be here. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.